You're watching HFO TV. Welcome back to HFO TV. I'm Aaron Kirk Douglas, Marketing Director at HFO. Here with me today is Phil Owen, past president of the Rental Housing Association of Greater Portland. Welcome, Phil. Thank you. And uh, our topic today is Senate Bill 91. It takes effect in January of 2014. This bill was put together by the Oregon Landlord Tenant Coalition. Is that right? That's correct. And um, were you part of that coalition? Up until the time that the bill was submitted, we opted not to endorse that bill when it came time that they wanted to start eliminating the possibility of using criminal background as a reason to deny a tenant. Okay. And the problem is, and I was really surprised that the screening companies didn't come down and scream bloody murder because this is basically has the potential of putting all of the tenant screening companies out of business. Mm -hmm. When you start saying what, that there is a, a, a group of felons that you can't use as a criteria in screening your tenants, then I think you're on a pretty slippery slope. Uh, pretty, the, the problem is we ask for a definition, we ask for a list of felonies that would be on the list as to what you would not be able to screen out for. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't want to do that. They said, well, if, if they're not going to hurt people, you know, if it's not going to materially affect your business, we think you ought to rent to felons. But they wouldn't define exactly what that was. And we couldn't support going in with such an ambiguous standard. Mm -hmm. We wanted to say, okay, you can, you can uh, not rent to rapists, murderers, but you can't use, if somebody was a uh, white collar crime, uh, say a, uh, an uh, embezzler or a forger, that you, you would have to rent to them. And we says, you know, that to, to our way of thinking, we couldn't support that bill. So did they eliminate criminal background check entirely in the final bill or the, was it? The problem, what it, what it is, is when you tell a screening company that you can't give certain information to a client on, a, on, a, on an applicant, uh, and if you do give them the wrong information, then you're going to be liable, and oh. mm -hmm. then then that screening company is going to be very hesitant mm -hmm. to give the report because this might not be information that you can use in a screening, and they're going to be liable because they gave you that information, mm -hmm. and. So how long are they going to be giving criminal background checks mm -hmm. when they have a liability if they make a mistake? And the problem is, is they don't know if they're making a mistake because there is not a list of acceptable felons. Okay. If it was clear, and this is what we wanted, we wanted it to be very clear who was acceptable and who was not, then we could get behind it. But since they wanted to be vague, you know, what's flexibility to some people is, is, is a liability because if you're wrong, if, you have, if they take you to court and they say, the judge says, you know, you thought that that was acceptable, but I don't think it's acceptable and so you're guilty. Right. And I want clarity. I want to say, Judge, this is what it says. This one is, uh, is okay. This one is not okay. 
then I would say, okay, I can understand that. I can conform with that. Mm -hmm. But when they said, well, you know, as long as they're not detrimental to your business or your property, you got to rent to them. So How, you have no idea what that means? I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's where it is right now. Well, it's, it's in law now. It seems like a very comprehensive bill. Um, what are some of the other things that landlords need to know? The renter insurance. Thing. Well, the renter insurance uh, again. Uh, you know, this is this is kind of one of my bones of contention is that, you know, I tried to tell the LTC that look, we are not insurance people. We are not in the business, and we don't know how to structure it. The tenant organizations say, well, we want to protect the tenant. So one of the things that they did is they said, well, you know, the landlord can't be on the insurance policy as a co-insured. Well, I talked to my insurance agent last night and they says, well, that's the stupidest thing you ever heard. Of course, the landlord's got to be on there because it's his property that you're insuring. You're, you're protecting that landlord. And so why they put this in is, is uh, it doesn't make sense. And then they put a, a dollar limit on it. They says, well, $100,000 uh, ought to be enough to, to cover the damage to the building. Well, that might be if you're in a $60,000 apartment, but what if you're renting my $300,000 home? $100,000 isn't going to cover the liability, and I'm entrusting you with my $300,000 home, and you're not going to have enough insurance to cover the damage if you do do have have a problem. And so, uh, you know, I talked to uh, uh, the, the the lobbyist that uh, says, well, one of my one of his clients is the insurance in industry, and they they didn't want to get involved in it. And I, so, like I told my agent last night, I says. You know, if you guys didn't step up to the plate and you knew it was coming down the, coming down the tracks and you didn't step up and, and come in and give your input, then you're, you're going to be subject to what you get. But as my agent says, this, these uh, policies that they have lined out, A, are not available because nobody, it's not a standard insurance policy the way they've got it laid out, okay. and, uh, and we don't know that anybody is going to step up to fill that gap should they do it. So uh, I think what's going to happen is, is the law is going to get ignored and they're going to still sell a standard renter's policy. And hopefully the best outcome is going to be that those uh, landlords that feel that they need the protection of forcing the tenant to buy renter's insurance, they will go out and buy a standard policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about new fees for rule violations? That was uh, something that they, the landlord or the tenant organizations thought that they could throw a bone to the landlords to get some of these other things that they wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they only added two new fees. They, they added a, uh, a fee for an illegal pet. So if somebody, right now, if, you, if a tenant brings a pet on the property, uh, right now the only thing you can do is give them a pet violation notice, which gives them a week to get rid of the pet and has no charge, uh, no fee associated with it. So they added a fee that you can not only get rid of the pet, but you can charge them a fee for the violation. Some of the landlords felt that um, there were some tenants that just figured that breaking the rules and being charged was just a cost of doing business. It just made the rent a little bit higher and so they would go ahead and violate the rules and pay the, pay the nominal fee. So what they wanted, the landlords wanted to do was make it escalating so the third, fourth, fifth time that they broke the same rule, they could charge more. Uh, quite frankly, to me, it was never a big issue because it wouldn't, it's nothing that I would ever do. If I can't get a tenant to cooperate 
after the first or second time, I'm just going to get rid of them. Okay. But some landlords feel that they would rather put up with the problem than and collect more money. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of different ways to look at running a property management business. And the people that I represent are, um, we have 1,770 members in the Rental Housing Association right now, and 90% of them have 10 units or less. Mm -hmm. So most of these are little mom and pops, and they, they can't have the problems they, that some of the bigger property management outfits uh, deal with because the big property management they're they're dealing more with how much is their bottom line and the smaller landlords are trying to manage a small community mm -hmm. so it's it's kind of a different philosophy okay are there any other parts of that new law that you think owners need to be aware of uh, you know, really, I, I thought that it was a pretty, pretty innocuous bill. I don't think that there was much that, uh, uh, you know, the the insurance was was something that the the biggest problem that I have is that you're going to tell some elderly couple that they're going to have to rent to a felon, mm -hmm. and I just don't see that, uh, you know, the that's something that should happen. We tried, one of the big things that we tried to do was we tried to be able to put up a firewall between uh, people with 10 units or less and 10 units or more. We think that there are a lot of things in the tenant landlord law that a larger property management company that has staff and, and has, you know, uh, more professional help, they can manage a lot of things that the small mom and pop that have decided to get into a rental property for their retirement, uh, they don't have the staff, they don't have the expertise, they don't have the, the bookkeeper and the attorney on, st on, on call that, that the bigger property management companies do. And so they, we felt they should be treated differently and, and protected from some of the um, some of the issues that have come up in the tenant landlord law. All right. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> Phil Owen, uh, past president of the Rental Housing Association of Greater Portland, was my guest today. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on HFO TV. Thanks for watching HFO TV. To learn more about HFO, call or visit our website. See new listings, apartment news, videos, and more when you download our apps at the Android and iPhone markets.